Hello, and welcome to Dust Jacket, Memoria College's podcast on the great ideas. Today, we're discussing Thomas Nagel's book, Mind and Cosmos, Why the Materialist Neo-Darwinian Conception of Nature is Almost Certainly False, a book which came out in 2010. This book occupies a prominent place in my library because it's one of those books of philosophy which is written for the intelligent layman, but that addresses some key aspects of the important question of how we make sense of our place as rational creatures in the world. We're going to talk about who Thomas Nagel is, why he is important, and why this book is important. It was part of a debate about science and philosophy that occurred during the first decade of this century. Uh, we'll, We'll be talking a little bit about that debate and why what was discussed here is still very relevant. And if you're joining us for the first time, please visit us at memoriacollege.org to see our list of online master's courses where you can read and discuss the great ideas with our great staff of instructors and our great collection of students. And joining me again today is Memoria College Professor of Philosophy, Dan Scheffler. Dan, um, this is a very small book. Uh, Why weren't philosophy books this small when I was going to school? I think in order to write a small book that has this level of content, you have to actually be a good writer. Mm -hmm. And many philosophers simply aren't. They kick their way around trying to eventually uh, say what they want to say, and it takes them 500 pages. Yeah, uh, it's become very technical, Mm -hmm. uh, the field of philosophy these days, really, Mm -hmm. in the last— I noticed this um, when I'm— when when I first got a hold of JSTOR and started, you know, uh, having a full library of academic uh, uh, articles I could get to years ago, I remember noticing that if you go pa- if you if you if you go before 1980, approximately, most of the academic articles written seem to be written for an intelligent, so that an intelligent lay public can understand them. Whereas after that, everything gets very specialized and very technical and, and that sort of thing. Is, is, is that a step back? I think it is. And I, I think some of it comes from the sort of publisher parish uh, contemporary academic uh, machine where you have a proliferation of uh, people with PhDs and it's a condition of their staying on at the university that they have to right. churn out. Uh, endless uh, pieces of of writing that that machine is not conducive to the kind of writing that you and I admire. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it mischievous incentives, I guess. Uh, uh, yeah, that is a problem. Uh, writing for only your fellow professionals and publishing in journals that only your fellow professionals read, and yeah, if that, yeah, that that tends to ruin good writing style. Well, let's start out talking about Thomas Nagel. Uh, the author of this book. Um, For those who are unfamiliar uh, with the world of academic philosophy, who is Thomas Nagel? What place does he have in the philosophical world? Uh, Well, Thomas Nagel is a uh, pretty well-known, influential, analytic uh, philosopher. Um, And uh, he's writing in the latter part of the uh, 20th century and Still, even today, this this book is is not very very old, um, and uh, he came to prominence uh, through um, uh, pieces that have to do with the philosophy of mind and the philosophy of science. Um, he wrote a, a fairly well known book called "The View from Nowhere" uh, that has to do with epistemology and philosophy of science. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, when I was uh, a newly minted philosophy uh, major in the early 1980s, I was required to read an, an essay by his called What Is It Like to Be a Bat, which uh, was an intriguing title. Perennial favorite. Yeah. 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 Why was I w- required to read that as a philosophy student? And I understand, you know, it's a, still a fairly mm-hmm. common book mm-hmm. to require philosophy students to read. Right. I, I myself uh, assign uh, what is it like to be a bat when I uh, teach intro freshman level uh, classes. Um, and I think it's it's an old professor favorite for those kinds of intro classes. Uh, for one thing, it's fairly easy to read as these kinds of papers uh, go uh, because Nagel has such a clear 
direct uh, writing style, he's able to make a profound point in a way that uh, the layman can understand, uh, which is especially good for, uh, you know, an 18-year-old class freshman. Uh, but uh, two, it's a, it's a great conversation starter. Uh, because that article, what is it like to be a bat? He he runs through this sort of fanciful thought experiment, asking the question: Is it possible for us to imagine what it's like to actually be a bat? Uh, in in particular, having a sense of our environment through echolocation, through rather than vision. And he says, well, you know, of course you can imagine. Uh, kind of how, how they do in the movies or something where where they you might imagine some sort of effect uh, over a video flying around. But of course, when you're doing that, you're just imagining what it's like for you, the kind of creature who can see to do things that are remotely similar to a bat. And that's not what it's actually like to be a bat at all. And he moves from that very fun sort of fanciful thing that's a great conversation starter uh, with, with students uh, to a more profound observation, that in fact, no amount of human knowledge about bats, no dissection, no scan of the brain, we could have a complete perfect map of a, of a bat's brain, will ever enlighten us on the question of what it's actually like to be a bat. We could know perfectly how the mechanism works of echolocation, but that's a distinct question from that internal subjective experience. The uh, consciousness that the, that the of a bat. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, now I, I don't have to go back and reread the essay because I've heard your explanation. There you go. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> let, let's talk a little bit about um, the setting for this book, uh, why it was written. Um, what was it that prompted him to write this book? Uh, well, there's, there's an ongoing uh, controversy in the philosophy of mind called the mind-body problem. And on top of that, there were, uh, and still are, uh, debates around uh, evolution and intelligent design. And further, there's debates uh, about reductionism as a whole. Uh, can we reduce things to, to purely material uh, reality? And all three of those kind of converge for Nagel in a nexus of problems that presents a certain crisis for what he calls on the cover the neo-Darwinian conception of nature. Um, and uh, this, this, I think, had a special prominence uh, just a few years ago when, when he wrote this book. There, there were the new atheists uh, that were uh, writing and in the news a lot, uh, people like uh, Sam Harris and uh, Richard Dawkins, uh, Daniel Dennett, that, that kind of crowd. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, Nagel here is an atheist. He says that quite clearly uh, right up front in, in the book. Uh, so he doesn't want to uh, argue for the existence of God. Uh, but he does think that there's something wrong with this reductive materialist conception of the world, uh, that it's inadequate. And he thinks that uh, many of the people in that new atheist movement are insufficiently uh, attentive to the shortcomings of their their own arguments because they've become ideologues. Uh, in a way that mirrors, in fact, the kind of dogmatism that on the religious side that they're claiming to uh, be against. They're claiming to be free thinkers uh, when, in fact, they're simply ideologically uh, asserting this, this reductivism with a confidence that is not epistemologically warranted. Well, and I remember that debate pretty well. I was actually writing for the Discovery Institute at the time, and— uh, involved in a number of online uh, 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 debates with some of these, uh, a lot of the the more online uh, atheists, P.Z. Myers and Lawrence Krauss, uh, and and um, and it just struck me how dogmatic they were, and they would make these statements that didn't address the issue at all, um, and a lot of those uh, debates had to do with 
the uh, the domain of science and where the domain of science ended and the domain of philosophy began, and they didn't seem to understand uh, the, the, the attitude among a lot of scientists. It's not justified by any evidence or any argument, really, is that uh, science can just be, you can remain within the domain of science and cover everything. Mm -hmm. that, 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 that the sort of hegemonic view of science. And so when philosophers, and when Thomas Nagel's book came out, that it was, this was an issue, when philosophers said, no, wait a minute, mm -hmm. the question of where the dividing line between science and say philosophy is, is not a scientific question. Mm -hmm. You can't, you know, heat it over a Bunsen burner and have it turn mm -hmm. the right color, and you got the answer to your question. It's a philosophical question. Mm -hmm. The question, the demarcation issue, it's called mm -hmm. in the philosophy of science, is a, a, an issue in the philosophy of science. It's not amenable to any kind of scientific analysis. And they had a really hard time accepting this, right. and a lot of them never really did. Um, so, and in, in, in scientists tended to get real surly <laughs> when— when you talked about science from a philosophical perspective, even though it was not science you were engaging in, it was philosophy, and they just uh, didn't like that. Um, so when when Nagel um, when Nagel is addressing science, where is he coming from? Where where is um, what perspective is he taking on this issue, which is the immediate issue? Uh, what sort of was the catalyst for this book uh, was the intelligent design debate, which is really, you don't hear much about it anymore, but it was it was the hot thing for uh, almost a decade, really. Uh, you had William Dembski, you had Michael Behe, mm -hmm. um, you had uh, Stephen Meyer, the signature in the cell, who were, who were all com coming some, with some very interesting mm -hmm. critiques. And um, scientists just sort of dismissed them without mm -hmm. any real serious, I think, uh, rational argument. So, what is what is Nagel's place in that debate, if right. you will? Well, as I said, he's he's um, he's not uh, on the side of the theists or the intelligent uh, design proponents per se, uh, but he agrees with the uh, some of the negative critiques of the intelligent. Uh, design proponents. Okay, uh, he says they're 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 fine on the on the negative critique of of the re reductionism and and some of the problems with contemporary evolutionary theory. Uh, but he doesn't he doesn't go with them in their positive proposed uh, result. Um, as to the science question and the demarcation issue, uh, he makes a very interesting historical observation. He points out that. Uh, at, at an early stage in the scientific revolution, there was a very intentional bracketing off of what is going to count as scientific, what is going to count as physical. He mentions uh, Descartes and Galileo specifically in, in connection with this, but I think we could also mention Francis Bacon, okay? Uh, and uh, in the at, at this period, um, they want to simply exclude from the discussion any talk about God or the soul or the purposes that God might have for things uh, or the mind, anything like that, so that we can practically focus on this limited domain over here of objective, uh, observable, empirical reality. Okay, but then something interesting happens in the history. People start to think because of that we we have this rapid progress in our knowledge of that domain that we've bracketed that all the things that we've bracketed out either simply don't exist or we need to explain them purely in terms of the newly privileged physical domain, okay? And he goes through a whole series of what he calls increasingly sophisticated forms of this reduction. This is on page 40. Uh, but he says, but all such st strategies are unsatisfactory for the same old reason. Even with the brain added to the picture, they clearly leave out something essential, without which there would be no mind. And what they leave out is just what was deliberately left out of the physical world 
by Descartes and Galileo in order to form the modern concept of the physical, namely subjective appearances. So there's this kind of circularity in uh, the, whoa, the the huffy scientists that you uh, mentioned earlier. And really, uh, it, it's not so much scientists as people who believe in scientism. And I know many very good scientists mm-hmm. who don't buy into this philosophy, but it's a kind of ideological commitment that says this bracketed domain is the only domain. And why is that? Well, because it's the only scientific. Uh, Which you could not know from a perspective only within the domain. (laughs) Exactly. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, he says on on Erland's book, on page three, he says, one of the legitimate tasks of philosophy is to investigate the limits of even the best developed and most successful forms of contemporary scientific knowledge. And so he's, it it almost sounds like he's trying to establish some space here, um, from which to operate that, that stations him outside of science itself. He's sort of already kind of moving in that direction. Uh, what is the role of a philosopher when it comes to questions which have implications for science? Uh, well, I think... Um, I mean, can't, let, me, let, me, and let me ask a related question. Can science itself ever give us a comprehensive view of the world? Well, I think the answer to the f- latter question is, is obviously... No. Uh, Science, because it is set up in its method from the get-go with this intentional act of bracketing that we uh, just discussed, in principle cannot cover all the things that it bracketed out of the conversation. Um, Now, the former question that you asked is a little bit trickier. Um, What is the role of the philosopher, when he comes to speak on questions that do have scientific implication. Or implications for science. Right. And and these are, th- those are two different things, I suppose. Um, I think it's incumbent upon the philosopher to um, be informed and abreast of the, the relevant findings of science. Mm-hmm. But the idea that the philosopher as such cannot speak to for instance, the epistemology of science or uh, the kind of logic that's going on in the scientific reasoning, um, I think is is nonsense. It's precisely uh, the scientists need the philosophers uh, to give them the tools to do the kinds of reasoning uh, that they do and to locate science within the broader picture of reality, just as the philosopher needs the scientist to furnish him with the empirical data that has been discovered and the best theories for accounting for that data that they've been able to come up with. Yeah, and 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 to to uh, provide some uh, some rational critiques mm-hmm. of the way science does reason. I mean, this mm-hmm. wasn't this David Hume's um, act uh, of critiquing the whole idea of inductive reasoning. Mm-hmm. And pointing out, look, you can't rationally establish deductive reasoning. You always have faith that the future is going to be like the past, but you can't prove it, Uh, which later came to be called the knowledge problem, which was never really resolved, I don't don't think. Uh, Hume's critiques of scientific reasoning— Never were really adequately answered. We just said, well, we, uh, we're we just moving along now. <laughs> well, I, I think there have been some responses. There have been responses, to, but I don't know how But they're not scientific they responses. Yeah, right. Or, yeah. Right. And I think, you need a, I think you need someone like Hume to come along and, you know, poke mm-hmm. at uh, the soft spots. Yes. Yes. Um, so, uh, during, during that debate over intelligent design, um, I—, I uh, there was a lot of exchanges. I went back uh, before before our talk here and, and just reviewed a few of those uh, things that went on back back at the time. And um, one thing I found that I said, uh, where, sci- where science fits in to the total scheme of things is not a question for an expert in science, but a question for an expert in the total scheme of things, which is a philosopher. Mm. Can you explain why that is a brilliant statement? <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say that uh, the primary reason why it is a brilliant statement is because it uh, proceeded from your mouth. Good, uh, good. I like that. <laughs> uh, no, that I think that's exactly right. And it, and it uh, links back up to uh, what we were talking about with Newman in the last episode, uh, which is that 
uh, Newman's project in education was not to create these little disciplinary silos, but ultimately to create what he called a broad-minded knowledge of the total system of things, Mm -hmm. right? Um, That that we want to see how the science fits in with Mm -hmm. the rest of what we we know. And so uh, the act, the the kind of ideological commitment that we need to just shove everything into only a physicalist analysis and nothing else uh, counts is just that. It's an ideological commitment. All right. So let, let's talk about what this book is about. Uh, what What is the question Nagel is trying to address in this book, if, if you if we could put it shortly, what would that be? Um, well, I think if I were to put it in question form, it's how could what are the conditions that a comprehensive explanation of everything need to meet, um, given that it must include the development of conscious life. Not just that, but life which is capable of reasoning and coming de- deriving valid conclusions from evidence, and finally uh, capable of apprehending value uh, and uh, responding to value. Um, he does not answer that question uh, in this book. He simply is mainly pointing out the problems with the existing answers to that question question. And at, at most, he simply sort of sketches or gestures at uh, what an adequate uh, answer would have to look like. All right. Uh, we're going to uh, pause our discussion here, and we will be back in a moment. The purpose of the Memoria College Master's Program in the Classics is to enable teachers, school administrators, and students to enter the great discussion, the conversation about truth, goodness, and beauty that's been going on in the Western world for over 2,000 years. We do this by reading the great books, talking about them, and writing about them. Our tutors help students to encounter the great classics of theology, philosophy, literature, ethics, political theory, law, and science. There's a lot you can do with great teachers and great books, but you can do even more when you also have great students, and we do. And I have said this, and I've told my students that I, I've been teaching at uh, undergraduate level for almost 20 years, um, and my Memorial College students are the best students I've ever taught. They're on fire for classical education, uh, and they want to learn, and they're very smart, and the collaborative discussion was just out of this world, and I felt as if I was um, being taught as much as I was teaching. Our liberal arts curriculum may strike many people as absolutely insane. These great books won't necessarily help you get a better job. So this might leave you wondering what the point of all this reading is. So what are the liberal arts for? Most fundamentally, they're for themselves. They're for your capacity to communicate effectively and clearly. They're for your decision making. They're for your character and your growth. Let's face it, we only have so much time in our busy modern lives. We need to make sure we keep in mind Thomas Aquinas' great admonition. The slightest knowledge of the greatest things is greater than the greatest knowledge of the slightest things. In other words, we need to make our time count. To learn to love language, to be steeped in history by sound reading and long conversation, to compose a sentence worthy of remembering, to do all this is to cast off, I think, the blinders of self, to leave Plato's cave, and to accustom our eyes to a light that blinds, but once our spiritual eyes adjust, can elevate and ennoble. Memoria College. Great books, great teachers, great students. Welcome back to our discussion of Mind and Cosmos by Thomas Nagel. Okay. Now, he... He, um, he says the starting point for the argument is a failure of psychophysical reductionism. Now, he uses, he uses various terms, materialist reductionism, evolutionary reductionism, psychophysical reductionism. What does he mean by that? Well, let's first uh, define the term reductionism. Okay, so a classic example of reduction is uh, saying that temperature 
is nothing but mean kinetic energy of the atoms involved and the particles involved. Okay, what does that mean? That means that there's really only one reality. It's being described in two different ways. One, kind of a surface appearance where we put the thermometer in and we measure, we get a measurement, we get temperature. But then another way of describing it is if we could know the kinetic energy of, of all the particular particles and do the average, we would find out that those are just two different names for the same thing. And a number of important scientific discoveries take this form. We, we say, hey, we've been measuring this one thing. We have this other concept over here. We find out by investigation that the one reality is really nothing over and above the other reality. So water is H2O. Water and H2O are not two different things. Two hydrogen atoms and an oxygen atom in such and such an arrangement just is a water molecule. Okay, so all of these uh, various uh, term, material reductionism, psychophysical reductionism, usually what people are trying to do is they're trying to reduce things that at first glance do not belong to the physical or material domain to something that does belong to that domain. The most conspicuous of which, of course, is mind, um, but other Things like beauty or value are also candidates. Why does he think that view fails? Uh, well, f he gives a number of, of reasons. Uh, for one thing, uh, specifically with the uh, concept of mind, uh, he goes through the uh, a series of attempts, primarily in the 20th century, to actually complete that reduction. Uh, and he shows how each of those, in turn, uh, fails, largely relying on the work of, of other uh, thinkers. He's simply documenting uh, the history of those failed attempts uh, by his account. Okay, so he goes through causal uh, behaviorism, he goes through functionalism, uh, identity theory, and he says, look, it's simply a fact that no one has yet given an actual successful uh, reduction of mind, uh, a mind state to a physical state, and uh, to believe that that reduction nevertheless is, is there or, or will be done is simply an act of, of faith, <laughs> uh, because you're antecedently committed to, uh, to materialism. Um, at a deeper reason, he, he goes on to say, Look, suppose that we could carry out that reduction, and it were true that all of our thoughts were really just nothing but uh, chemical reactions in the brain. Well, then we actually have a problem because our reason for thinking that all of science is true, any particular scientific discovery, would then rest on that which is nothing but a causal chemical mechanism by, by hypothesis, okay? And he points out, as other people before him, like C.S. Lewis, have pointed out, that uh, a cause to an effect relation is simply different than a premise to conclusion relation. So, f discovering that one brain state, which is the thought of a premise chemically causes another brain state, which is the thought of a conclusion, is not at all the same thing as drawing a valid inference. And so if it is true that we discover one day that uh, all of our thoughts can be reduced to uh, brain states, chemical brain states, then in fact, by that discovery, we've undermined our entire epistemological grounding that led to us making that discovery. In, in other words, place. you come to some conclusion, and it can't be a, a, a valid inference. It's it's the only thing you could have thought given the antecedent conditions, right? Right. Yeah, and and yeah, that does remind me, like you say, of 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 Lewis uh, in his book Miracles, where he. Um, the, the Encyclopedia of Philosophy calls it the argument from self-destruction. Mm. 
uh, and, and he quotes HBS Haldane saying, if my mental processes are determined wholly by the motion of atoms in my brain, I have no reason to suppose that my beliefs are true. And hence, I have no reason for supposing my brain to be composed of atoms. So exactly. you can't even hold the position without right. self-contradiction if you, if you believe everything is just a material uh, cause and effect type of thing. Right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, and I'm going to, I want to come, come back to that a, a little bit later, but um, he, uh, he says early in the book that man has always in- aspired to the ideal of discovering a single natural order that unifies everything on the basis of a set of common elements in principles, uh, elements and principles, a theory of everything. We've always aspired to this. Uh, and we, we've striven for this theory, this sort of key that unlocks the mystery behind all things. And he says that Cartesian dualism mm-hmm. rejects the possibility altogether. Um, and that materialist reductionism is a failed attempt to find this single natural order. And that he says it is incompatible with theism. Mm-hmm. So he's saying not only is is materialist reductionism insufficient to answer this question, but he thinks also theism is. Is he right? Well, let's uh, let's take the dualism question first, and then the the theism question. So uh, he he poses this objection to what's known as dualism. So first, let's let's get that that term on the table. Dualism is the theory that my body is one thing, my soul is another. I explain bodily material things with one set of concepts and terms. I explain soulish, psychic things with another set of concepts. And they somehow work together in the world. And isn't that what's meant by the ghost in the machine? Well, and the somehow is the the key there, right? Uh, There's the famous, what's called the interaction problem of, okay, if we have these two totally separate worlds, uh, how is it that the soul ever does do anything with the brain and how is it that the brain and the rest of the body ever do anything with the soul? Uh, Descartes, in fact, thought that it all traced to the pineal gland and that there was some sort of, he he thought that the nerves functioned as kind of mechanical strings that got pulled and somehow the command center was in the pineal gland. But of course, that just, uh, then you just get a sort of homunculus problem that, okay, well, What's pulling the levers in there uh, ultimately, okay? Um, and so he thinks that this this kind of explanation uh, simply won't do uh, because we want to give a coherent account of all of, of re- reality. It's fine to say, okay, there's different kinds of things. There's solids and there's liquids. But we want to explain how solids and liquids a solid becomes a liquid, a liquid becomes a solid, how they interact with each other, and put it within a larger framework of explanation. So he's he wants, uh, and he says no one's provided it yet, he wants a theory that can include mental phenomena alongside of physical phenomena and make sense of all of that within a single consistent Are you talking about Descartes frame. or Nagel? Nagel here. Yes. Yes. Sorry. All right, now to the to the theism question. Why is it that this uh, drive for a single theory of ev- everything rules out theism for Nagel? Um, well, I think he has an unfortunate uh, view of what theism uh, entails, and it's partly based on, uh, I think, what many theists, in fact, <laughs> are saying, and, and uh, I think some people's theism really would uh, result in this. Uh, so let me read uh, the paragraph here. This is on page 25. He says, a theistic account has the advantage over a reductive naturalistic one that it admits the reality of more of what is so evidently the case and tries to explain it all. But even if theism is filled out with the doctrines of a particular religion, which will not be accessible to evidence and reason alone, it offers a very partial explanation of our place in the world. It amounts to the hypothesis that the highest order explanation of how things hang together is of a certain type, 
namely intentional or purposive, without having anything more to say about how that intention operates except what is found in the results to be explained. So what he's saying there is good if we posit God, he, we can explain everything in the world with a single account. We can explain why our minds are the way that they are, why the physical world is the way that it is. Well, it's because God wants it to be that way. So it's God's intentions that tell us why the world is. But then God is now pushed outside of the explanatory framework, and there's simply nothing more to say about it, okay, uh, without having anything more to say about how that intention operates. So when it comes to why God would want this rather than that, we simply sort of, have to remain Sort of silent. tables an important question. Exactly. And, and in, at that point, in fact, uh, it fails to be an explanation at all because you can explain anything by saying, well, God wants it to be so. Yeah. And that's simply not an explanation anymore. Well, right? and he says that theism reverses the materialist order of explanation. What does, it, what does he mean? Do you know what he means by that? Uh, right. Well, so uh, the, the idea is that uh, the materialist order of explanation tries to explain intentionality from the ground up mm -hmm. from non-intentional causes mm -hmm. to eventually get agents that intend things. Mm -hmm. Uh, this goes the other way. It simply starts with the brute fact of an agent intending things and then tries to explain all the chemical interactions and, and all of that through that. Now, where, where I think he fails is I think he's resting on a concept of uh, God known as voluntarism, that God's intentions for the world are simply arbitrary and that it's this black box. God is this black box that we can't know anything about uh, or or discover anything about which is, which is some which is a a, a a theological belief am I mistaken from the late middle ages uh, which is not the standard uh, orthodox I guess view of God right not on my account anyway <laughs> <laughs> right right uh, he says intelligibility needs to be from within mm. how, how, how does that do what does that have to do with this critique? On theism, is he saying that that we don't just need the God, God's God did it thing? We need something that it, that explains it from within, not just something we can kind of pass off to, to the eternal. Is that, is that right? What exactly. We we can't just have a God of the gaps. We have to actually see the uh, intrinsic plausibility uh, of things right. of of our explanation. So so he's 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 critiqued um, materialist reductionism. He's critiqued theism. We 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 both said it, it it's a, a sort of a misunderstanding in a way of what theism probably really is in its fullest sense. Uh, well, it's not quite a straw man because I do hear some yeah, theists sure, taking this sure. kind of position. Right, right. right. <laughs> but but he says there's three ways to approach this. There's the materialist reductionism. There's theism, and there is teleology. Uh, it, it, he he says um, he says materialist reductionism. Intentionalism, which is he means theism, refer to, mm -hmm. he means to refer to theism there, and then teleology. What is that? Right. So his his distinction there between an intentional account and a teleological account, I think, because uh, at first blush they kind of seem like they the do. Thing, they, they seem, and a lot of people think of teleology, don't they, as intention? Right. Things have purposes. Well, where do the purposes come from? Well, from from God, right? Um, but on his account, an intentional account would be one that gives the reasons for things externally. They're sort of being externally imposed by some kind of arbitrary fiat. That's that's where that the voluntarism is connected to that the arbitrary character of that that pur purposing. Whereas what he calls a teleolo teleolog teleological account. Uh, and what's the origin of that word? Telos is uh, the Greek word for end or goal or purpose. Uh, so a teleological account for Nagel is one where we can see the purpose of something, what it's aimed at or towards, intrinsic to its very intelligible structure. So when we really come to understand the way that an eye functions, we can see that it is for eyesight. 
um, and that's intrinsic to the, the structure of the eyeball, uh, independent of some sort of external arbitrary fiat being imposed. It's something that, that still the uh, materialist reductionists would have a big problem with, right? Right, right. That, uh, that, that there would be this thing purpose, this ghostly thing. That's not something you can right. explain materially. Well, we uh, going back to the historical uh, uh, line that we were investigating earlier, that was one of the chief objectives, uh, especially of Francis Bacon, uh, was to eliminate teleological accounts from scientific explanations uh, because in, in his day, a lot of physical science was being done in an Aristotelian and an alchemical mode where the explanations for why metals had certain properties was because of their purpose in the overall cosmos. And he was saying, look, that's, that's sidetracking and distracting us from just figuring out what their uh, their properties are, their quantifiable properties, okay? So let's just forget about tele- teleology and leave that out of a scientific uh, account. Um, and this is exactly the kind of thing that Nagel uh, is pointing out. This says, look, bracketing is one thing, but then you can't just pretend that the thing that you uh, <laughs> have bracketed off has gone away forever or that you've somehow discovered that it doesn't exist. Now, when you start talking about teleology, uh, you're hearkening back, aren't you, to some ancient concepts. And in mm-hmm. fact, Nagel himself says that this brings the specter of Aristotle. Mm-hmm. Um, how, do, how are we to think about a modern philosopher who's kind of bringing back an old um, ancient uh, concept from ancient philosophy? Well, to my mind, uh, that's just what every uh, good philosopher does. <laughs> <laughs> well, and hasn't this, I mean, has, hasn't teleology experienced a sort of revival mm-hmm. in recent years, partly due to, uh, to Alistair McIntyre's work mm-hmm. uh, in ethics? Uh, bringing back the whole idea that, you know, what good behavior is, what, what what right and wrong is, is the action that brings you into alignment with your telos. Uh, so, and that's starting as early as 1983 when McIntyre comes mm-hmm. out with his book After Virtue. He's writing in 2010. Um, it's interesting that that he's bringing back teleology in another arena. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And what are we to think of that? Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, and and it's not just limited to those uh, two. Uh, if it, once you start poking around, this notion of uh, Aristotle's revenge uh, yeah. <laughs> keeps keeps pop, popping up. Yes. That teleology is really an ineliminable uh, aspect of of our understanding of of the world, mm-hmm. um, and we simply can't do without it. Right. 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 Now, this the distinction between a cause and an explanation. Mm-hmm. It, 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 I, I was thinking, but is, isn't, isn't what the materialist reductionists are trying to do is come up with a cause and effect account that doesn't really amount to an explanation? Mm-hmm. Am, I, am I right about right. that? I mean, right. peop, a lot of people don't understand what the difference between a cause and, uh, a cause and an explanation is right. uh, he he says um, he uh, um, Nagel talks about three things basically in this book um, consciousness cognition and value all right uh, we'll we'll have to leave value out that's that's a, a more complicated thing but in the, in this in the on the issues of consciousness and cognition he wants a theory that can explain those two things. And it can't be a causal theory, can it? Right, right. It, it's got to be an explanation because mm-hmm. it's hard. I mean, I don't, I don't, I, I'm assuming it's a hard thing to try to find the cause of consciousness physically, mm-hmm. if, since consciousness is not physical. Um, what is the project here? What does this involve? And how does, how does Nagel try to address this? Uh, first of all, cognition um, or uh, excuse me, consciousness, which is com- which we have in common with mm-hmm. animals, 
uh, and then cognition, which is unique to human beings. How does how does he go about trying to address that? Well, so he gives he gives a great uh, analogy for the distinction between uh, causation and explanation. He says, imagine a little uh, solar powered pocket calculator. If I type in the the four keys, five plus three equals, and then onto the screen springs a little crystal figure of the numeral eight, okay? I can give a causal account of exactly how that happened, purely in scientific physical terms, okay? There's there's a little mechanical switch under the five button that closes a circuit, and there's another little switch with the plus button, and so forth and so on, and there's electricity being provided by the little solar panel, and a little chemical reaction is caused and, and causes the number eight to appear on the screen, okay? But an explanation, he says, is a not just of an event, but of an event under a certain description. So an explanation would be, why is it that eight is the right answer that the symbol on the screen represents a quantity, which is in fact, the right answer to the sum that was represented by punching the the switches on the other side. Which is an above and beyond the little pixels that make up the eight. Exactly, exactly. And so to to have that in hand, you would have to know why it is that a system is set up in such a way that eight comes out when you put these numbers in and why, why it is set up in that way. And that requires a teleological understanding of the system. And so he says, what a successful account would be is an account of the universe that understands the whole system, including all the physical interactions, including our brain, including the obvious interactions between our brain and consciousness, that makes consciousness, and then later cognition, antecedently likely, given those prior uh, conditions of, of the universe. And he says, at present, we have no such account. But he's hoping <laughs> for one. Right. Uh, yeah, I've, I, uh, you, you can't, no, the, the way I look at it, and this, this may be a parallel thing and not the same thing, but... I cannot understand, if I have a quote here on this piece of paper in front of me, uh, that Haldane quote I I used before, I can't understand anything about that any better by getting a magnifying glass and looking Mm -hmm. at the letter and seeing how the Mm letter is made up. And that does not get me to an understanding of what is said Mm -hmm. by this statement printed here on this paper. Is that the same thing? It's a, that's uh, another good analogy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so that's so that's consciousness. Okay. Uh, what do we say about cognition, reasoning? Right. Right. Well, uh, so we we're going to need a similar thing. We're going to need some account of the universe uh, that um, makes makes it plausible that it would contain beings that are capable of rational inference and all the other things that we do with higher level uh, cognition. Um, And he says specifically, we're going to have to come up with a worldview that is capable of including itself. And what he means by that is any worldview that undermines the conditions of having a justified, reasonable worldview in the first place is not a very good worldview. And that's part of his problem with uh, the the kind of scientism and reductionism that he's uh, critiquing. So we're going to have to have a worldview that contains an explanation for how it is that there are creatures with worldviews and make that not just... uh, a vanishingly small possibility, uh, but in fact something that is probable given the kind of uh, reality that's included in that worldview. 
Yeah, I have another statement I see here. It looks very familiar. It appears maybe possibly to be mine. Uh, either consciousness is part of the world or it is not. And you could say the same thing about cognition, I think. If it is part of the world, then any attempt to explain the world will have to have an account of it. If it's not a part of the world, then there is no way to explain anything. Exactly. Another brilliant statement, you think? I, well, it came out of your mouth. Okay, yeah, good. Um, all right. So, when you, it, it is a frustrating thing to talk to scientifically minded people about these things because they, they can't seem to see what you're saying. They, are, they seem very content with these uh, narrative accounts. They, they give these, what, what uh, I, I think he calls in this book, I've seen, I've seen this expression before, just so stories. Mm -hmm. We come up with this narrative of how this happened. We just give a chronology as if that chronology constitutes an, an explanation. Right. They never have a part of that chronology that, that, is, that is an explanation. That, that's, that, that says not just this came after this, but this happened as a metaphysical result of this other thing. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's always a hard thing to do. And you see this with, you know, and in fact, the, he mentions evolution quite a lot in his book. This is, this is the, 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 a lot of the um, propaganda that you get, whatever your view of evolution is, the propaganda you get is the story. And there's, a car, there's an animation, you mm -hmm. know, and you go through this thing. And it kind of seems plausible, but you know Ken Ham at the Ark Encounter does that. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a, he, he's brilliant at, at. I can tell a story. You can tell. I, a story. We, can we can all, all tell, tell stories. stories. We can all give a just a story. So you go to the you go to the Ark mm -hmm. uh, the uh, Ark Park, and he what the, the the power of that exhibit is it makes it look plausible. Um, I was surprised myself that, that the Ark uh, had uh, modern bathrooms in a gift shop. <laughs> but, 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 but anybody can play that game. Mm -hmm. And that's not an explanation. Whether you agree with it or not, it's, it's not an explanation. It's, it's a just-so just story of some kind. It doesn't, mm -hmm. doesn't mean it's false, but it means it's not sufficient right. to, to prove, that, 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 uh, that, uh, that, uh, prove your position. Um, so, um, the, uh, the problem with, um, with this sort of, and again, that seems to me to be very similar to Lewis's argument from self-destruction here, that if you, if, you, uh, if you only come at this from an account that is materialist, and then you are not able to, that, that doesn't even put you in a position to where you can look at the whole system. You, your mm -hmm. your your ex your your account is from inside the system, and it doesn't encompass the system itself, mm -hmm. right? Am I saying that? It right? doesn't even allow for the possibility of there being such a conceptual system. Right, right, right. Okay. Um, anything else we want to say about this? Um, it's a it's a it's a it's an interesting book. I, I think um, it's one of those books that I mean, you do need a little bit of philosophical. Do, do you need philosophical training to read this book? Uh, I think you need to be uh, an, you know, a literate and interested person, uh, but I don't think you need to be an expert by by any means. I think, again, back to where we started, Nagel is is admirable for his his clarity of statement. Yeah, yeah. I think if if uh, you know if our if our listeners uh, want to read this book, I think it's I think it's something that certainly I think the the students at Memorial College uh, who have who, who are able to handle our program, certainly, I think, could go through this slowly, maybe. Uh, it does, I, it was easier for me to read simply because I had uh, been involved in a few of those public debates myself mm -hmm. and, um, and was able to kind of have a context to know what, what actually he was saying. I don't know, many of our students read Hegel. In well, that's true. If you can, so read, if you can Hegel, read Hegel, you can then you can read just about anything. <laughs> that, that's, that's right. Um, yes, my, my chief, somebody meant, came up mentioned Immanuel Kant and the Critique of Pure Reason. It was on Twitter the oh. other day. And I thought, you know, I actually read that book. I mean, that was a big book. And they didn't get us books like this. So, like I said before. All right. Well, uh, there's there's a lot more we could talk about in regard to this book. But um, if our audience would like to investigate this further, uh, they, might, they might try reading this book, Mind and Cosmos by Thomas Nagel. And 
uh, it's it's a well again it's a well written clear book it, it's it's as clear as you can get I mean there's some things that are complicated just by their nature um, but this is about as clear as you can get and you know the issues being dealt with are perennial issues here uh, thank you for joining us today remember to visit us at memoriacollege.org uh, check out our course offerings read more about what we're we're doing here and check out our incredible staff Memoria College great books great teachers. Great students.